I get spare time to talk about the goal. And again, I'm not an expert, but uh, I really, I really enjoy this book. It made, it, it certainly made some changes because I, I, I tried some experiments out. I had a whole lot of support and encouragement. Like it was good, but, uh, and like the, we were explaining last time, like the timing was right in my life. So like a bunch of stars aligned. So but that's a, it's kind of a point. This is fun one, because we get your, we're doing it together, right? You're have the courage to come out and record this thing. The idea was planted months and months and months ago. And, and it's actually finally happening. I remember I was looking at my emails. I'm like, man, I remember saying that we were going to get started in my head, January or February, we're going to start recording. And then like life was happening. And here we are, June, and <laughs> I'm like, okay, maybe a little off base, but again, like the, just the tenacity to continue doing it. But, you know, something you said that I, we often forget, I've forgotten many times and I've seen other like lean freakos or, you know, c continuous improvement minded people get frustrated. You said that when, like, when you read, when the goal came into your life, it, you were ready. It was the right time and you <laughs> soaked it in and it trans, you know, changed your trajectory. Same thing for me. When, when I got introduced to like the last planner system, I was ready for it. And so I was like, okay, my, I'm tired and sick and tired of whatever I've been dealing with. There's gotta be a better way. Boom. That's what we're going to do. But when I go and introduce it to somebody else and they're like, eh, you know, hesitant or just straight up don't want to do anything with it. I judge them. Right? I'm like, oh, you're just a red hat. You're just a blocker. Oh, yes. Instead of saying, hmm, how did I respond when I first got introduced yes. to it? What's going on? This is the second installment, the second issue, the second recording with Mr. Thomas LeMay on our collabo session over the goal. So far, the feedback on the first one has been amazing. I kind of knew like, yeah, it's long. This one's almost as long. But it's so packed with his stories of how he applied what he was learning, like in the moment. He makes references to his journal that he was keeping as he was going along, building this project in San Francisco and jotting down what he was taking away, his, ob his personal observations and the little experiments he was running on site. It weren't very little. They were actually pretty darn huge. I'm feeling like that little journal is going to be worth some money at some point in the future. Hopefully he'll leave it to me or the l &M family. He'll leave it to us in his will at some point. Anyhow, another super cool thing, like have you ever been in a situation where people are kind of dropping hints or doing something pretty awesome and you just kind of miss it? Well, that was me like the whole time. Thomas is giving shout outs to the no BS tribe, Steve Martin, Jennifer Lacey, uh, Adam Hoots, the rest of the crew, and he keeps plugging like this book. There's this book out there known as Lean and Love, and he keeps referencing it. It didn't occur to me in the moment, but going back and editing, I'm like, man, this dude's just like, just the kind of people you want to be around. So if you haven't caught the first one, go back <clears throat> by now, the, the YouTube version, the video, so you can see our bright, shining, smiling faces will be available. So go check that out. If you want to see that, we got a whole bunch of clips that we've been posting on all the socials, just outtakes of some of his wisdom, some of my goofiness. Uh, we deeply appreciate the support. And speaking of support, we're going to give a shout out to all our patrons who have been faithful in their contributions. And if you're interested in being a patron and contributing to the effort of enhancing the image of careers in the trades, you can go to the learningsandmissteps.com. Uh, click on the become a member, click, 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 and choose the way you'd like to contribute. Also, any likes, any comments you make on, on the post that we have out there on the LinkedIn or the, or the TikTok or the Facebook, whatever, those all help too. We are extremely grateful for all of the support, all of the encouragement, all of the takeaways, all of the things that you're doing with the knowledge that you get from these interviews. Uh, paying it forward and making things better for people out there in the world is exactly what we're looking for. And here we go. A little bit more of Mr. Thomas LeMay and it ain't over because there's several more sessions to come. I rejected it also. 
And it was when I was ready that it all actually started clicking and coming together. But if you go to judgment, you always go to control. So if you put a label somebody a hat, give them a hat, <laughs> you've already judged them. Yep. And it's hard to do. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying let's stop it. Let's stop judging people. Meet people yeah. exactly where they are. That's it. That's so it. I want to talk about that. If you if you care to be vulnerable. Absolutely. We're going to talk about fear. Go! Yeah. And it's there's a lot to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Especially right now. There is a lot to be the f afraid of. Fear is one of the most powerful emotions. It has a strong effect on your mind and your body. And as we developed as human beings, fear was one of those instincts that we had to have. We had to have very quick thinking understanding of that's a saber-toothed tiger i can see it in the dark or maybe i can only hear it but i know what it is and i'm afraid of that because we want to preserve ourselves we want to preserve and continue doing the stuff that we get to do like i have myself and right now it's it's also a heck of a time to be alive absolutely oh man all this stuff that we have like we have robots at work the stuff we do with with technology it's just I get out of bed and I'm like, oh, what's that? What's new? So for me, when I was reading this book, I struggled with anxiety. Ooh. And I want to talk about anxiety because it's a type of fear. And the, the, the word anxiety it tends to describe worry because right? you're worried about something. Right? Like, it, like you have a job interview or you have to have, you're in like a competition or like, but you, it's before you do it. It's like, it's the right before. And you're like, Ugh. for me, I get like, I, I get a weight weakness like heaviness right right mm. in the center of my center of my mass because I, mm -hmm. I, I know why i do it now because I've, I've studied it and i've been studied by medical professionals <laughs> but i shorten my breath i hold my breath i literally hold my breath when i'm anxious i will hold my breath and when i hold my breath that's because i'm being anxious problem with anxiety is you feel that about almost anything you feel mm. uncomfortable about things that aren't they're not threats Okay. Or, so your my mind just wanders. It just wanders. What's what is your like feeling? Because like we all, it's all different for every every one of us. It's different for every one of us. My me, I hold my breath. I do. I literally hold yep. my breath. And if I hold my breath, I, I will pass out because right? yes. you don't get enough oxygen to your brain. So in a panic attack for me, I will literally like brown out, and uh, it's it's not good. That's that's not good for being healthy. But browning out is also like. Uh, it's a medical e event, like it's an acute medical event that you need to seek help for. So I did, thankfully. But how about you? You know, so I'm going to say maybe the last six to eight years ish, my response is to like, let's go, let's do this. So when I feel that that challenge or that that situation that gets me uncomfortable and like questiony, like oh, my response is like, oh, well, let's go do that. Like, let's just jump in. Let's just do it. Now that hasn't always been my response. I remember, like before six to eight years ago, my response was run, like depart, leave, sever connection, get the hell out of there. And that's exactly what I would do. When I started seeing different signals, I would, okay, boom, got to go. Got to get out of here. Got, like, I'm not dealing with this. But there's a couple of things, like, there, there. I used to get, like, the anxiety, like, the overthinking, the anxiety thing. Again, that's another thing. Like, I start, it's like, I'm, I'm running a gazillion scenarios, because I still do it, trying to figure out what the other person might say or might prefer or might not like. And the reality is the only way to find out is by giving them the damn thing. So stop wasting time and just jump into uh, it and hand it over. Yes. And then they'll inform me of what I need to fix or what they like about it. So, but that's, that's over practice and pre like I do it over and over and over again. And I get a lot of flack for like, man, you're not going to like, no, I'm not like, I don't know what they want, what they told me. This is what this, the request they made. I got some clarification. This is my understanding of the request. They may not like it, but I'm going to give it to them so they could tell me what they don't like. Like I can't read their mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's helped me that that's one of the things that, that helped me take the leap and in going into business for myself. Right. Because like it's working, <laughs> that's worked in my career, at my job, you know, the one 
biggest fear that I have that I wrestle with on the regular is my fear is leading people astray, like leading people down a path that doesn't serve them. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's my big because I've done that in my past. Right? Like I've introduced people to um, what's the word addictive things and saw it ruin their lives. And I was responsible for that. And and now the way I function or since then, the way I function, I have a lot of res responsibility and autonomy to make recommendations and just take like you decide, Jesse, just lead it. And so there's this weird, weird fear because I don't you, most of the things I'm doing, I've never done them before and I don't know that they're going to work or maybe I don't know exactly how to make it work. And so what if I lead people off a cliff? That's a real, that's like a my daily check. When I'm doing my afternoon inventory and reflection, like, did I serve appropriately? Where did I lead people astray? And what can I do to avoid that or correct that tomorrow? Because it, I, it's again, it's such a fear that I have. Dang, that's, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yes. man. So for, for me, and this is my, this is my method. Okay. This is my method. So for anxiety, and you said it, action. Ah. You're anxious about something. Take action. Ooh. So we're going to talk about action versus just moving around in the coming chapters. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yes. Right? So there's a there's a there's a there's a the ridge you got to walk down when you talk action, right? But if you're anxious about something, and we're talking about fear, so we like label why why no red hats? Like why don't they ever do the stuff? Like this is an amazing met system because they're afraid, right? And if you make fun of them or judge them, it's like boom. Oh, you're Done. now now you're you're making me afraid and you're making fun of me and you're judging me. Yeah, like I'm gonna I'm already I'm off. I'm turning it off. Yes. So and we're men, like we don't want to be afraid. So We'll, we'll put up an armor. So for, for me, I can counter anxiety with action. I can read stuff. I can study. Like if you're on a project, there's a oh. stack of drawings that tall. Look oh, at yeah. them, right? <laughs> See if they match. Or, or do overlays or do so. Like you can, you can, you can counter anxiety through action. Mm. And action, there's, there's, there's some steps yep. with action. We're going to talk about that. And the other, and fear. Fear is harder because fear is, is threat, threat level, right? Yes. So fear for me, this is only me, I can overcome fear, most fear, not like direct threat. I have to run away from it. But for fear, I have to, I can overcome it with focus. Oh, okay. So I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can control my breath. I can control my physical state, like where I'm sitting or standing most of the time, unless I'm like, in an airplane, we're going to talk about why anxiety <laughs> in airplanes. Because the reason why I have anxiety in airplanes because I can't control my physical state. I'm out of I'm out of my control. Right? I'm bound yes. by laws and doors yep. and people in yes. front of me. Yes, yes. But I can focus when that in that moment. I can focus on my breath. I can control breath. So my control for fear is is can be overcome through focus. Nice. So if we're afraid of things on our job sites. We're going to talk about constraints. Yeah. Exploiting constraints. And then you can't make, you can't be afraid of those things. Like, yes, we live in a, a very funky time with the supply chain. We yes. Can't just, we can't just report the news, but we can have conversations all the way, all the way up to the supply chain. It's harder, right? You might have to speak new languages because those. Yep. The, the raw materials might be in a foreign country, but we can find out. And once we focus and we understand the constraints, we can like exploit them be like, you know what? We know that now we know exactly where it is and we have a tracking mechanism. Now yep. we can, and we can also control the things on our job site, speed and installation and all this yep. stuff. All of a sudden we're not afraid anymore. Mm -hmm. We're in control, we're back in control, even though the world is kind of funky and there's Lots of conflicts out there and constraints. If we can overcome our fear through focus, man, it's so much powerful. So those are my two kind of nice. systems. And, and I focus. wanted to set it up before we talk about chapter seven because it this is that this is the the moment mm -hmm. Alex goes home and meets his family. So we were talking about last time, like, and I said there is no membrane work life. There is no membrane, right? You just oh. because your life is all the time. 
So Alex goes home and meets the family, right, who loves him and is also frustrated with him. <laughs> so he kind of t- does a little reflection. He kind of looks around and sees some, uh, and I'll quote the 5S in relationship series, but like relationship clutter. Yeah. Oh, God. Like inventory, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And he, he thinks about his, his family's, like, other, like, he does some comparison to his brother and his parents. Like, they live on the other side of town in smaller homes, less exotic. They have simpler jobs. One's a general manager of, like, a, a, a small grocery store. I think his parents are retired. They used to run the store. So yeah. it's, like, he's thinking about it. It's like, hey, what if I just did that? Like, is that... That'd just be easier. <laughs> so he's like looking around his house and he's like a big shot. Like he's the general manager of a, a manufacturing facility. Like probably does pretty good. But he, like when you, when you do that and I have the same problem, like how much is enough? Like oh, how man. Much stuff is enough. And then you have, so you have lots of stuff. And for me, it's clutter because it clutters up. It's like, I got to change the oil and the Buick and us and cut the grass and that and that. Well, like we start to clutter our lives up. Yes. What do you think? Oh, you introduced this to me. This concept yes. I didn't understand until <laughs> Dan and Jess introduced this concept. The chapter seven just right over my head. So thank Man. you. <laughs> That's Tell all. me a story about seeing clutter in your personal life. There's two that come to mind. So one, because I'm looking at like relationship clutter in quotation marks. And I don't know why. I'm going down memory lane. But when I was in high school, I was popular with the ladies. And I was selfish about that. And But I thought I was, like, super smart, right? Because I, if I had a – I didn't date anybody, like, after my freshman year, I didn't date anybody from my high school until, like, my senior year. And whenever I did date a gal, they I just made sure they went to different schools because the likelihood of me getting busted, like, was zero. Except I didn't – factor in football games and so we had gone to a football game i can't remember who was playing and and i went with the gal super nice super sweet young lady so we're watching the game and you know we're there and my group of friends are there and then another friend shows up with his cousin who went to another high school that we she and i were familiar and i'm like oh damn like it was we weren't like boyfriend and girl but you know it's, it's just it wasn't cool that i was doing that Anyways, so she looks at me and I'm like, oof, okay, super, super uncomfortable. And then the another gal, we went to, we went to the damn concession stand. And I see another one. So that, those of you who were born after 1990, this is the phase that we called it talking. We're like, hey, we're just talking. Yes. Because Facebook, social media didn't exist. We had to talk. So this was the talking. Yeah. Oh, that, you know, what? <laughs> we're not, we're, so yes, this is the, uh, I am dating myself very much. But I went, <laughs> I went to high school in the 1990s and we thought this was the talking phase. So yes, yes, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to interject in case some millennials are younger, you lost them. So yes, can you please continue? That's perfect. No, no, that's a perfect <laughs> clarity. Cause yeah, like we, that's what we did. We talk on the phone and we'd flirt and hang out when at parties or whatever. And, but, and we were in person quite often. And and so when we were the first gal when she showed up, my date was she could tell like something was up. And then that other gal was like, Hey, I need to talk to her. like oh she gave me a hard time and she's like, like, no, like it's fine, whatever. <laughs> then we go up to the concession stand and there's another one from another school. Like, what is she she like she really didn't no read she was there. And she just runs up, hugs me, and kisses me. What with this other nice young lady next to me, and I'm like, oh damn, like this. It, it, she just looks at me and she's like, you're just not the guy I thought you were. And I'm like, okay, you're right. So, anyways, clutter, I didn't need all those, I didn't need to be talking to all of the, those young ladies because the reality was in that situation, that was super extreme, but the reality was keeping track of who I was with and who I made a commitment to, who I was going to meet somewhere, what I told them. That was like, talk about extra processing. (laughs) Like it was all this energy and stress that I didn't need. So it took a few more years for me to maybe another decade for me to like, stop, figure that out and stop doing that. But the other thing that, that comes to mind, like clutter in my personal space and you touched on it. There was a time like when I was a foreman, 
all the way to when I was a superintendent for the trade partners. In my mind, if I had a two car garage, three bedroom house, a truck, a car, vacations, all the shiny things, like all of those things, like that was going to be, that was life, right? That was the goal. That's when things were going to be amazing and awesome. And the reality was accumulating all of those things for my prison because with those things was debt, right? Like I oh, had, wow. yeah, like I got them, fi- I had to finance the house and to finance the car, the truck, because I, I don't mind driving no beaters. So it's like, whatever, going on vacation, like all the, having all furniture and TVs and like all the junk that you got to have in a house was debt. And so I, my job, I was hating my job because it was always the same story, always the same arguments. But I needed to do the job to make the income to live the life that I thought I needed. And, you know, a lot of things happened at that point in my life. And my focus after that was like, okay, I need to get out of debt. And as soon as I get out of debt, I am going to find and do a job that I love, do some meaningful work. And I did that. And I'll tell you, Thomas, from from that point in my life, I can trace it to where I'm at today. And what I mean by that is the depth of fulfillment that I'm experiencing today is a direct, it tied directly to that decision I made. So I decided to filter out all of these superficial collectibles that enabled me to get out of debt, which enabled me from that point forward to always choose the work that I do, always choose my boss and always choose the people that I work with. But I had to sort all that junk out. Yeah, it's enough. Mm-hmm. It's enough. I, I, I'm the same way. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I've met a really amazing person, my better half, Angel, who is yeah. an architect, who kind of who designs our life. But uh, yeah. so I, I wrote down some things. I think that some listeners could take away. I wrote, I wrote eight things, and I, and I, and I wrote this kind of after listening to five S relationships. So this is yes. a little gold rat, little Jen and Jess, a little sprinkle in. Uh, so number one, make a decision about what you value most in life as a person. It's, mm. it's a decision because we're going to, the chapter eight, we're going to start getting into throughput and inventory. So you have to take an inventory. Yes. It's personal finance, especially like if young people, please learn how to balance sheet, please. I yes. wish I did. Yes. But so make a decision what you value, what you are, what are the value things? And make a list of them. Two, once you do that, evaluate your relationship at that moment. Oh, yeah. Like the current state of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's that focusing step because you do like these are my values. Yes. So you kind of put yourself in a framework. And at that point, you have to do the you have to do the inventory first. Second thing, you evaluate, do the do the reflection. Steve, Steve Martin, do a reflection, evaluate, and it's looking in the mirror because it's only, it's here and now. The only time you can see yourself in the mirror is when you stand in front of it. And it's easy to reflect on the happy time, right? It's like, oh yeah, this is exciting, but you gotta, it's the, it's the sour and the sweet. You gotta think about the painful times too, because this is, and that's because of bias. Yes. So it's like, I, these are my values, my priority matrix, whatever you want to call it. And based on that evaluation, once you do that evaluation, remove anything that consumes your emotions or lowers your self-esteem. Ooh, this yes. Is the, and that's the, this, this takes immense courage. Or this takes almost, it, it, like, you need somebody to let their hand on your back. Like, yes. What I would say when I was a lean manager, once you make an improvement, drive a freaking wedge under that thing. <laughs> Make and it don't, stick. Like, don't let it roll back. And the only way to drive a wedge is take whatever you were doing last time, straighten the bin. Yep. Straighten the bin. Throw that thing in the dumpster, whatever it is. If these things that you want to remove in your life are, are people or family members. Yes. So you have yes. to set boundaries. Yes. Around yourself and start saying no. Or start saying yes, but. Or saying yep. no, and those kind yep. of things. And it's, you have to do it in the, these, for me, this, again, this is not like life hacks with Thomas LeMay, but this is just <laughs> kind of like my learning from learn, listening to Jen and Jeff's and, 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 and a whole bunch of stuff. Yep. But you base that, base that evaluation on two things. If it's consuming your emotions, right? In a, in, a, in a negative way, I should say. Right. 
Or if it's lowering your self-esteem. If you do something that, that makes you feel bad, stop doing it. Yes. And it's hard, super hard. So and then so this is the step. Step four, increase the quality of your interactions. And I I'm terrible with interactions. So in, any <laughs> any increasing of equality is probably measured in micro millimeters, but it's like <laughs> turning off the TV or focusing, I'm listening to you, I'm gonna look at you. Yes. Um, I'm not good at that. I am yeah. not, I will tell everybody right now. Okay struggle with this but but my thing is like if you would do it something you truly value it focus the quality so quality is if you're with someone you're not staring at your phone so then it's like okay if you're trying to increase your interactions there are quality of interaction there's going to get some constraints start to pop up and we're going to talk about chapter eight so treat your relationship like a garden if you have a garden do you have a garden i not currently but i have okay. had gardens in the past yes i have I live in North Carolina, so everything just grows like crazy here. So I'm like yeah. constantly. But you think about it, if, or you think about a farmer, they prepare the soil. First thing they do is prepare the soil, plant at the right time, remove the weeds, water and fertilize, and then adjust. You got to look at the dang plants. If they're drying out, give them some water. If they're look, looking spindly, they need some sun or whatever. But you have to look at it and make some adjustments from there. And so how do you do that? You give first that's step six. Oh yeah Get first and expect little yes and for me that's my ego just just oh man i'm like hey hey i wash the car <laughs> give me some loving right like yeah. th thank you for doing the thing that i wrote on the scrum board a week ago congratulations <laughs> you can move it to ten <laughs> right? but so the so my thing is that's i call it smart comment but if you're doing like a pull plan, it's that I give, I get. Yep. So if if you have trouble, if you have a if you have a terrible ego, like a flawed person, no, I, I'm right there, hundred percent. Like, but if you I, if you have that if you have that inner struggle where you're like, ah, like, give me some kudos once in a while, then do a little like ninja move. It's called smart compromise, and it's like, hey, I give, but I get. And then the last thing is empathy. So it's like, how do you how do you knock it out of the park once you've done the first seven? Empathy is a critical human ability, and if you, if you get stuck, seek professional help. Thank you, Jen Lacey, for teaching you that. <laughs> You're stuck in your relationship, and I need I need professional help in my garage right now. Like I need a cleaner. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. come in and just throw it, just all of it, just throw it away, just throw it away. Saving that for I don't know what. Yep. Just throw it away. So yeah, I need professional help or third party friends, neighbors, take stuff away. So yeah, so if you have clutter and you get stuck. Seek help. It's clear to me that doing it in order is going to reap the best results because it's like the first one facilitates the second one and so on. That like all the way down to empathy. And and you're right, like empathy is not the easiest thing in the world. And getting help may be necessary. Well, actually, we'll say I'll say it differently. Getting help is only going to increase the the depth of the empathy. Right, understanding from an objective perspective, because I could tell myself I'm empathetic. I could say that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I need objective, an objective perspective to confirm or deny that. <laughs> yeah. So you have to do it in that order, at least for me. Yep. But but before we get to chapter eight, I, I use that analogy because it's it's all these prescriptive steps, and if you yep. follow them in order, you will you will improve. We will improve. So, nice. Do chapter eight because we're. This is the step. This is that. Uh -oh. This is uh -oh. the first step in fear uh, because you you confront it. The only way to overcome fear, you have to face it. So, chapter eight, we're gonna go back to Lou and some accounting principles. And I, like young people listening, if you want to like network within your company and grow like your bounds, find a controller. Find an accountant, find a finance manager, find someone who is not in operations and ask them what they do and listen. It's, it's really awesome stuff. Yes. Uh, so Alex, he goes to his parents' house and he's like, I need Jonah's personal phone number. And he's like, it's in this notebook that I, I wrote the number or some kind of contact information in a notebook when he was in grad school, probably. And he threw it in his desk at his home. So he goes home, he tears the house apart. Speaking of clutter, 
And he finally, like, he finally gets a hold of Jonah. And he goes, and they, they find, I don't know. I think they talk on the phone, I think what it is. And Jonah says he won't. He goes, he tells Alex that he won't make any improvements to his plant by following the same old methods. You can't, and Einstein has the same thing, like you can't make any improvements to the situation by using the same amount of effort. You have to use more effort to improve, or you have to use new methods, or you have to seek professional help. Yes. Right? You have to, you, cause like you'll fall into the same traps cause it's really hard. We're all, we're mere mortals. So, so Jonah gives Alex three measurements. This is really cool because I actually tried, tried to do this when I, when I read this chapter like 10 years ago, but it's page 60. So it's three measurements, a measurement not clearly defined is worse than useless. Yes. So if it's like, like Hey, we're going to, we need to improve our profitability, profitability. We need to improve that. Like, okay. What like what's, what does that mean to me? Yes. Like, like, we, need, we have to like, so there's three, number one. Throughput, counting principle one, controller, throughput, the rate at which the system generates money through sales, sales, not production, sales. Yep. So sales effort, I'm, we get into a business agreement, so you're going to buy 100 units, and you pay me for that 100 units, that's throughput. So it's sales equals acceptance production, or excuse me, sales equals acceptance. Sales is, is acceptance, like you fulfilled the deal. Yep. Production is just the work you put in place. That's accounting principle number one, according to, and again, this is not financial advice. This is according to the book. Yes, yes. <laughs> to inventory, inventory, all the money that the system has invested in purchasing things. Yes. Butter, your truck out, parked out in the driveway. And maybe I had to go to the bank and borrow money to yep. forfeit my vehicle or my house or the couch and the, like all of your inventory. It's all, it costs money to buy it, purchase it, move it, move it, get it on yourself. So if we have inventory laying around job site, that's not installed, generally yeah. speaking, generally speaking, I don't want to upset some of our financial gurus in the construction yeah. industry, but generally speaking, we bill for that material once it's set in place. Yeah. Typically speaking, yes, there's probably some, some bills that are going out or this is the second of the month, so they're probably being reviewed right now. But if it's being delivered to the job site often, we can charge for that. We can we can put in a bill and say, this is we have fulfilled the material portion of this order. It is on the job site. We can bill for it. So that that now represents throughput. But now we have inventory sitting around the place. So inventory is money that you've spent in things. Operational expense number three. Operational expense, all of the money the system spends in order to turn inventory into throughput. Yeah. So that's hiring plumbers. Yep. It's hiring an architect. That's hiring Thomas to go around and take pictures of trash. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. That's all yes. of this, all of the stuff we gotta we have to get permits. We have to burn diesel. We have to have electricity. We need water. We need sewer. We need we need stuff. Mm -hmm. We need internet. We got we got bills to pay. Right. Swag, you need project swag, right? Swag, right. dinners, all the stuff to turn inventory into throughput. So those are the three rules. So in construction, the equivalent of throughput inventory and operational expense are exactly the same as manufacturing. Prove me wrong. Uh, no argument here, sir. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes, there are nuances, obviously, sure. but in the fundamental those things inventory operational expense and throughput and i'll i listed three here so application for progress payment inventory operational expense throughput like we have we're percent complete on this task or this operation we have these sets of materials on site or in bonded warehouses here are the photographs or the drone video that proves it right operational expense here's the backups the pay stubs all the stuff so we have we paid these suppliers this is our application for progress payment. I put it all there. Boom. Submit it over. Please docu-sign this and then wire me money. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. that's the application. That's the first application. Two, sometimes we order stuff that is manufactured and prefabricated systems. I work for a company. We have many factories within our own 
within our own control. So we have material and prefabricated systems and procurement and delivery. The stuff needs to move towards us, but sometimes prefabrication is like the job site, but we put the job site in Arizona or Florida or California or up in the Northeast. Yeah. And then labor in general conditions, operational expense, right? We have to hire yep. Jesse. We have to hire electricians. We have to hire things, and then we have to put electricity to drive the hoist up in it. So those are those three things. What do you think Dr. Goldrat doesn't measure in his concept about throughput? The schedule. Yeah. BC? <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't want to. Just a little teaser there. I just teased it. Yeah. Yeah. We have a CPM schedule, and we, and we also, if we're using Last Planner, we have some other metrics. Yes. But we're only talking right now about accounting principles in Chapter 8. So what do, yep. you, what do you think about those? Or should we just get into that? No, no, no. I have a thought about it. So my thought about that is when I think about schedules, and like full disclosure, I am not a, a CPM schedule master. I am a CPM schedule critic <laughs> because I'm... <laughs> I've had so many of them that I had to like, what the hell are we thinking? But it's not the, it's, it's the thing, right? It's the way we use it, et cetera. But I think we treat them like they're actually measuring throughput. But if looking at this thing, what they really do is give an up at best, a give an update of the current state of inventory and operational expense. They have it. That's it. Like it, it doesn't accomplish anything else. That's my thought. Got it. We're going to get into that. Get your steak knife out. So I really want to talk about it. So chapter nine, because now we know we know Jonah's basic measurements. And they're like, okay, I got Lou. I got printouts. We got a computer. We got we got machines. We can we got we got stopwatches. This is the 80s with actual right hands. So yep. they go back to the plant in chapter nine. And my summary was sometimes new and improved is biased. <laughs> uh, yeah all the time right it's like oh let's try something new and it's like that's a trap too so when, so it's two things you get you get stuck in this weird paradigm where it's like hey we don't want to go back to the old ways according to jonah but if we get super excited and we uh, we, we try all this new stuff uh, we might lose sight of things so i wrote myself a note i gotta find it I get this is a, I did my a self diagnosis number one in my self diagnosis and I was like I was I was reading this maybe not this chapter but one of the chapters I did a little self reflection I wrote a note to myself I said number one daily conversation is oh no this is this not this again this is the <laughs> daily conversation oh no not this again that's in your and notes you are writing that down this is my down. self yep. analysis and then <laughs> number two. Oh, this sounds cool. I wonder how it will work out, like being optimistic. So you have this, I had this weird inner monologue in my mind that's like a torn between it's like conform, I want to follow industry standards, boom, blah, 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 blah. I want to try new things. Yeah. So what I did, I was like at a seminar or something. They were like, they built the Empire State Building in New yes. York City in 18 months. And yes. I looked at my schedule and I'm like, this this building is half as high and it's 18 months. Like, what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing? This is the 1930s. Yeah. So I went, I got a book that showed all the methods mm. that the Empire State Building did. I don't want to, because I'll, I'll go an hour just on that. that book. <laughs> but one of the things was line of balance schedule. We, we call it flow line. Yep. So I was like, there it is. This, this is the way. Right, young Thomas was like, they were doing line of balance with like, they didn't have Excel, they had yep. they had drafting tables. So, but you can measure flow. Yep. Um, so in that book, there's a whole bunch of them. And I was like, oh man. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the book. They go back and they challenge the team about the NCX 10 robot has been done. Like tell me, like, what is this robot? Like, like I want to challenge it. I don't think we, we have these accounting principles now. Uh, Jonah spun me all around, like spun me in circles, thinking like this is I'm running my plant into the ground because I'm not looking for the right thing. So they calculate the new technology has only been efficient in its local department. Like this, like this, this it's probably like a CNC milling machine, I imagine. So it's computer driven, but so they can it can crank out some parts and milling, but it doesn't improve all the other fabrication steps after it. 
So it hasn't led to overall improvement. So what it does, it just pumps out stuff yeah. uh, locally. And they, fa they face the reality that the NCX-10 causes more problems because of inventory. Because mm -hmm. it costs more money to run the dang thing because it piles up inventory. We got to we gotta keep buying raw materials and pumping it into this machine. And it cranks it out. It's a robot. Yep. You can run it three shifts. But they, uh, they come to the realization that the, the robot is a constraint. They're like, oh my God, like they look at it. And uh, so I go back to the Empire building. If you chart production in a vertical building, so if you, you know, you stack the yep. terms up it's in flow line scheduling or line of balance, there's a pitch, right? Because you go, you go from location one to location two. And if you're ax, X, X, so that's the Y axis is all yep. your location. So floor one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 88. I think the empire is maybe it's 80 and your X axis is time. You can plot as built progress in vertical or in location and time. Yep. And it's, and it makes a pitch. And I read that in that book and I was like, I got to I'm building a vertical building. Like these guys in the thirties, they got it. So I, I tried it and I measured each crew for like a couple of weeks and I just charted it and the pitches yeah. weren't the same. They were not the same, Jesse. Uh, was there a lot of deviation? Right, their pitches yeah. were not the same. Uh, so they would, so when the flash. line of balancing, when they touch or they cross, problem. that's a problem. That's a yep. big problem. Yep. Um, and I read it in that book. Wow. So that was my realization of the theory of constraints. It's probably the wrong, for the TOC experts out there, it was probably the wrong realization. But <laughs> this was my realization that if we have we have a system of, of locations and production, and if we can chart them and we look for the locations where they, they bottleneck yep. or they actually cross and that's, they stop, then they stop. That's a constraint. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is it. This is, I'm an expert now. What was, <laughs> what was your realization? Man, it, I don't know if it was ever, I, I don't know if I can call it a realization because I know that I repeated it over and over and over again. And then I just got like sick and tired of that, what was happening. But what I would do because, so I think I was, uh, I was transitioning, like I was on the transition phase from foreman to superintendent. And so what that means is I had multiple projects. Like I was the, like specifically just the plumbing foreman, but on multiple projects. And what I would do is I would get my team or get additional personnel and work to a bottleneck. And then downsize the team, take them to another project. Like I just kept working to the bottleneck. The problem with that is it was peaks and valleys in labor. And so for me, I didn't care. Like I just called the office and say, hey, these fools are going to be back. Find them a job for next Monday, right? Like I call Tuesday, you got four days, find them a home. Well, but what would happen, like I felt like I was winning, right? I'm catching up. I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. But what would happen is those bottlenecks would clear up sometimes at different rates, sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> and the worst part was when it opened up all at the same time because I could not resource them. And now I'm getting uh, yelled at now. Your pitch, yeah, your pitch goes flat. Like flat because I'm not, I can't, I can't get people over there. I'm taking care of this bottleneck and that kept happening. And I was talking to, to Jim, he's like, Jesse, what are you doing? And I, so I, I'm telling like, yeah, you know, this job, but that son of a gun and I stuck, you know, you're just really bragging about it. And he's like, well, you realize that you're creating your own problem, right? That fire, fire arsonist, fire, arsonist firefighter. Yes. Cause I'm creating my own problem by rushing to the bottleneck and create like stopping at bottlenecks everywhere. And there's, I have no influence over their rate of, of opening up. And so they would open up whenever they opened up and boom, all of a sudden I got three projects saying, where the hell are you? We're ready for fixtures. Where are you? We're ready for test and balance. Where are like all these things like, Oh, and that's how like, Oh, he's like, you, you need to like look at your whole thing and manage your production so that you don't have to pull people off the job. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, so back to the pitch, right? adjust my production, adjust the, the head count, whatever I needed to do to maintain an even pace so that I didn't hit the bottleneck. Because the problem was when I pulled people off, I wasn't always going to get the same people back. 
And when I got a different crew back, there, even though they were being production or productive, it wasn't like the rate of production was low because they were still learning the damn job, learning, you know, where the porta potties at, where do we park, where's lunch, like all of those things that are important, getting oh. to know everybody, the painter and everybody's life story, like it, the production was killed. So that was, it, again, you're talking it was, like you're talking like Fred Brooks, right, with his law. Yeah, <laughs> if, it's hard in the beginning if you throw extra people at it because yes. you gotta learn the job. No. Yes, yes, hundred percent. You gotta learn the project. It's not like you just plug them in and they yeah. everything happens. Yeah. So when I realized that, I actually had the uh, had someone in our organization at the time who knew how to do line of balance very well. Ooh, like, okay. very well. Yes, Janie Winning. Thank you, Janie, if you're listening. She put our, our, our CPM schedule into a computer program that, that did the visualization. And it was, Jesse, it was like choirs of angels. Really? Because I was like, now I have my own charted line of balance schedule that was the baseline. And I was like, oh, they, and they, they were not parallel lines. Our, yeah. our plan, our original plan, they were, we did it, we did the study because Early on, we knew, but I was like, "Yeah, what is that?" But I didn't understand flow, the flow line part, yep. until I came to that realization. So we went back, we pulled that thing out. And we're like, "Oh, this is interesting. Can you load the last month's update into it and see?" Yep. And it, was, it looked <laughs> like spaghetti. But here's the thing about confronting the facts. Mm -hmm. Now it's not like it's the stair crew, man. They're slow, man. They slow. Like we're looking at stair crew now. They're, they're they go, eh, stop, eh, stop, eh, stop, because they would run out of structural steel to yep. land their stairs. And they were they were telling me this, right? Like, but I wasn't listening. Nope, nope. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I got all kinds of stuff. And then we got into this uh, overtime discussion. Ooh. Because yeah. some of our trades weren't in, we didn't say tact then. I guess we tried to, but we didn't understand. But they right. weren't parallel with everybody else. So if they were more flat, if their if their flow line was more flat, they had to they had to get to the next level. So they had to work overtime. Yes. They had to work Saturday and Sunday. Geez, we worked our steel decking crew seven oh. days a week. Yeah. Seven days a week. Just go. Just go, 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 go. And uh, it's nasty work. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard, I'm sure you have that deck saw. Oh yeah. It, it's, and they cut an opening. It's yes, loud, punch. Yep. They're banging around, they're banging and clanging. People that do steel decking, like I, yes. Uh, thank you. That is a. You're, I mean, you're you're on the top of the. You're doing roofs. You're basically standing on a mirror all day. And right? no matter what floor they're on, you're, there's they're, sun's you're on their positive, back. And it's not ergonomic. Like you're not walking on the concrete floor. You're walking no. on the deck, right? <laughs> yes. So we realized that we we're like, we gotta go talk to Carlos. Carlos and the decking team. Like Carlos, man. He's like, I'm like, I've been looking at this all wrong, Carlos. Like, we like, we're, we've been running you guys raw and blaming you for our problems. Yes. And like, I, he's, I don't know. He was probably just be like, what is this egghead? But yeah. he was like, yes. And I'm like, Carlos, let's figure out how to make you move faster before we start talking about a hike and herbie. Oh. Go but I want to oh. tease it because yes. Carlos. Was our was was our Herbie in the in the upcoming chat, and uh, and I'll leave it there. But we started that discussion. I'm like, look, look at the chart. Like you're clashing with the steel guys, and you're also clashing with the concrete or the rebar and the other trades because you have to constantly go back. Like you're doing up and down. too yep. much movement. You're going back, and he's like, yep. yeah, like some of this information, Thomas. I'm not getting until late. I'm like, okay, oh, I'm gonna control good. the information flow. So. And I'm tease that we'll go back to Carlos, but I came to that realization there because that was the constraint was yeah. information. And I'm like, boom, that's 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 our job to get Carlos information. So number one, why do you think prolonged overtime is dangerous? Man, because you get damn tired, right? I mean, just fatigue in itself. When we're working overtime, there's only been a few times in my career, like maybe four times that we worked overtime because it was going to have big benefits for us and big, like it was not under duress. 
all the other times we were working overtime, it was under duress to like, we're behind, everything else is in, we're like trades are stacked and six, seven days a week, you never get to recover. And now you're being exposed. Your exposure to risk goes up because you're physically present longer to whatever the hell that risk is. So the likelihood for injury starts skyrocketing. It is. Sleep is important. Yes. And especially in the Bay Area, the workers don't live near the work. Oh, yeah. Because the, yeah. So they're right. so expensive. So, and it's a super commute. Some of our workers out there commute two plus hours from Modesto oh. and yeah. inland. So, so when we prolong our work hours, usually where they make that up is in their sleep because they have to get up at 4 30 and make start making yep. their way into the bay area and it's like hey we started at seven we have all these rules we have the meetings right out of the gate so if you miss if you're late you miss everything so so being prompt is important but um, it is dangerous to yes. prolong and it's very easy and, and i have done this to turn when you're doing your cpm schedule turn the calendar to seven days yes. like I want a seven day calendar on these three activities. Yeah. These are words I've said many times and it's, it's easy. It's like, just, yeah, sure. You save three days because it's like work Saturday, Sunday weekends. You turn yeah. off all the time off. It's a struggle. Yes. It's a struggle. And I will say that it's, it's, it's all the time. It's every day. It's not like we're, we're, we're being malice or whatever. These are just constraints that we're faced with. And yep. oftentimes we use the easy button of overtime. Yep. To make up for that, that make up for our <laughs> unparalleled flow lines. So that's that's one way. How about inventory? Oh, Jesse, you <laughs> might you perhaps have a story about this. Have you ever flooded an entire floor of ductwork because the duck guys and gals said it would be faster for them? So it's kind of, yes and no. So yes, I would flood the project with duct. Not because we said the team, the install team said it was faster. Most of the time that I did that was to hog up space so that the plumbing and piping didn't have any other trade in their way either. <laughs> so because we were, you know, mechanical contractor. Oh, you're was, doing both. We did all three. We did plumbing, the hydronic piping, and the sheet metal work, the duct work. So the best way to keep everybody else out of our damn space was to flood the damn job with sheet with duct and and we'd shake it out and lay it out on the floor like no no no, no. just lay it out just stage it just stage it They're like but yes we can hang i said like, no, no no because as soon as it goes up the framers and everybody else is going to come in and we still got to run all this pipe so let's just and that's why i did it i did it to hog space did it really slow anybody else down from coming on the project no what it did was i got yelled at all the time and our stuff got banged up and kicked yeah. around and pushed around and we had to work over it like Yes, I flooded the project all the time. I thought I was winning. And when yeah. I had to come back and take things down and there was damaged duct and there was damaged insulation, et cetera, et cetera, I didn't get ahead. Like, and all I did was piss everybody off right out of the gate. Yeah, so that's that's one way. I'm, I'm worse and I have a story teed up. Uh -oh. I do a lot of teasers. But uh, we're going to start talking about controlling flow with limiting inventory. So uh, I, w I would slow, well, at least I, I'm sure the statute of limitations is over, but I'd slow trades down by limiting their access to loading down. Uh, so it would be like, I'd limit, yeah. I'd limit their time. And that is, in some ways that's also smart to do, <laughs> but I would be nefarious about it. I wouldn't tell them what I was doing. No, that's um, a good point. So, like, it, yes. it, it, they were, when, when everybody's they, aware. They would of be frustrated, yeah. Yes. Because they didn't know. Yep. Carpet carpet installer was special. Yes, I am sorry for doing that. It, they're so fast. Yes. Especially, rug, especially rug type. So the way to slow down finished flooring trades is to limit. Because once they run out, they're done. They go home. So number three, rework. How come I'm talking about constraints? So I have a constraint. I have an have information problem. I have, or there's a change, or there's a alignment problem, or there's a clash. We skip past that. We're like, ah, I can still do the whole floor. Let's not we'll worry about that. We'll come, mm -hmm. we'll do the go back thing. Yep. Why is that dangerous to human beings? And I said, my note here was because when you go back and do that work, it's no longer designed the same way. 
when you were going to do it the first time. So the ergonomics. Yes. Especially at height. Yep. Especially at height. And especially if there's other encumbrances. Yes. Around your head. Yes. Oh, those of the trades that work above their head. Like that's, that's some hard work and thank you for doing that. But like one thing we could do to help serve those people is if there's a problem, we don't put more stuff in their way. So they have to do like yoga poses. Right. Or worse, like put themselves in harm's way because there's really no physical way to safely do that task. Yep. It's very, very hard and time consuming. It's hard on a human body. And often we do that. We, we design that system for that yes. person, right? We put them we in that create, We create the condition oh. and say, go do it. And then we walk the job and say, what the hell are you doing? Is it there a safer way to do it? Like, yeah, yeah there was. <laughs> there was last month when there was nothing here. So it's, 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 it, this is, these are constraints. Yes. These are constraints and there's consequences to, to making decisions to go around stuff. I'm not saying we can't do that. We can't make smart choices and we can't use contraptions to protect ourselves from falling. But hey, if there's a issue, we have to get in front of it yes. before we put a person up there. So that's, that's the thing. So, oh yeah. And then I put number five, don't ever sit <laughs> next to me on an airplane. And the reason why when you get onto the airplane, if you ride Southwest, get on, you get, get on onto the airplane. Cause it's very important for an airplane to leave on time because they have to, there's a cycle time they have to achieve because yes. they have to reach their next destination and hit that same cycle time. Deboarding, I think it's for deplaning doesn't matter because they got other stuff they got to do. They got to gas up the plane. They got to yep. take the luggage out. They yep. got, they got time and they know about how long it takes it. But if you're me sitting in like row 22, the way people deboard the planes is there's A, B, C, D, E, F on typical, like, like 737, six yep. seats. All of those people have to de deplane and they're like, they got to get up. They got to figure out, I was like, oh, did I leave my phone here? All this mm -hmm. variation. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like, there's, there's a way better way. And the army's already figured this out, how to get off a dang airplane in, in a hurry is you get off in columns. So all the A's. Go. Go! Nobody else get up. Just the A's. And you get off the, the you get off the plane like paratroopers or rangers or Navy SEALs. And they get off and they go off in rows. And you go yes. to all the beat. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I know this. And I have anxiety. And I know <laughs> this method of, of getting off the plane. And I just get frustrated yeah. with that. And so there was a funny story. That someone was like, I bet you, like, when you're sitting in the airplane and people are getting off, like, I bet you scold them. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, I literally pull people back down. Just, 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 just chill for for a second. You're you're giving me anxiety. <laughs> I thought I'd tell that story. That's awesome. So I guess you really like. Did you like the pictures I said too of the boarding? And who sent me one too the same day? Oh, did you? <laughs> I guess I'm probably like gonna get everybody's gonna start. Now you're gonna like, get all kinds of pictures. Yes. Just, just please, United, Delta, Southwest, please just deboard the way you onboarded. Yes. If you're in Section 5, leave in Section 5. And that way, if you're like, oftentimes I'm trying to connect to another flight and I get anxious about it. I can't control it. I can't focus. I'm going crazy. So I start to start to try to, you know, fix the situation and use best known practices from the United States yes. Army. Get off the dang plane and calm. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Let's do chapter 10. Let's do it. Chapter 10. Ooh. 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 This guy, you know who this guy is? Emmy. Emmy. Oh, yeah. Actually, I work with a gentleman who went to Dr. Deming's seminars. Really? It's so fun. Yes. That's awesome. But, so chapter 10 links, it starts to talk about the new economics. So Alex, I'm just going to very, very briefly summarize this because we're getting long. I love this book. Alex yeah. explains the principles. So the new economics, it's a whole bunch of uh, principles about changing the way we, we look at how we manage uh, here in the United States. And there's, there's other methods that are non-traditional to the United States at the time when he wrote that, I think in the 1950s or 60s. And uh, he said, we need, to, we need to evolve into this, this state of economics. So at chapter 10, Alex faces these same 
issues and local optimums don't matter. So if you're locally optimal, you're, you're just, you're just knocking it out. It feels good. It yep. does, yep. but it really, in the grand scheme of things and new economics, they don't matter. And this is a tenant or a, maybe a principle of theory of constraints. The local, local optimums don't matter. Results must always be measured against the goal. Yes. So any results that you have, that you've, that any KPIs, dashboards, and I do, I deal with this every day and I constantly am trying to focus a project teams or a business unit into always trying to measure yourself against your overall goal, whatever, all of your other metrics, those are good. But if those aren't talking to the goal, then who cares? It's, a, it's a distraction, right? So it's a yep. local optimum. So if, if we need to do, we need to look at that and we do this constantly. That's, that's why it's such a good time to be alive. Throughput inventory and operating expenses should be reflected in financial metrics. And the Ooh. reason why financial metrics are really good because they're controlled. They're, they're, yep. They are principle based accounting laws. And, and the best thing is like, if the goal and the goal in this book was we want to make money because yep. once we have money, we can pay people, we can. We can uh, keep the plant open and we can keep doing our job. So we need to make some money. So the goal of whatever, whatever your, your primary goal is, if you set your financial controls to those same goals, like if you're, if you're personally trying to save some money <laughs> in personal finance, you start to take inventory of all your expenses, right? And yes. your inventory and be like, Hey, this. 62 inch Samsung TV that I never watch. That's a, that's inventory. I could sell that mm -hmm. and, and turn that into some throughput. So uh, if you reflect, if you reflect that in financial metrics, and this is what happens in chapter 10, you can optimize because you can, you can see where you're spending money. So in yes. the plant, Alex is like in CX 10, we got a milling machine. We have all kinds of doodads and gizmos and, and manufacturing processes, heat stuff up and cut stuff down, and, uh, all this kind of stuff, install components. Yep. Um, we build factories, so I get to, I at least get to see the front end of it. But explain the great project manager versus the superintendent argument regarding schedules, budgets, staff, and working weekends. This is the, uh, this is the, the PM and the super conversation. Because talking about goals uh, and traditionally speaking, project managers care about the business deal, mm -hmm. right? Keeping the client aware of the situation maintaining the schedule, maintaining the controls, making sure things are being paid for, making sure, making sure the business end of the deal is being managed. That's they're managing the project. Generally speaking, they're oftentimes a leader, but their main focus is managing the business end of the deal superintendent. Their primary mission is manage the physical operations, right? Of all the, the operations. So all the physical things that are happening out on the job site or about to, like if they're coming towards the job site, we're managing that. So you have kind of differing sets of values. So it, we deal with this all the time. It's like, it's like this, this constant tug, like you're just like open your dang wallet so we can buy a, a crane. To mm -hmm. install the things on the roof. Like, we want us to float this with air balloons, or what do you want me to do? Oh, God. I got a so, great story for that. Right? Okay. So, there's a, there's, there's differing sets of values. And that's why metrics come into play. But tell the story. Oh, man. So, classic, right? Project manager, we had, we had a team. It wasn't a big, it was a small retrofit. They were changing out the chillers, putting in brand new chillers. They had a to like, totally enclosed chiller yard. They didn't allow enough space for us to fabricate the chill water supply lines in that space. It was just, you know, the, everything was in there. So we had to fabricate them outside of this space and we needed a crane. Like the ideal situation was to fabricate, like minimize the number of welds we had to do in the chiller yard. And so we wanted to build it all out and we were like, hey, project manager, we need a crane project manager, like hadn't even walked the job. His response is, well, it's not in the budget. Okay. Well, in order for us to make the labor budget, we're going to have to do all the fabrication out here and not in there. 
And so there was this argument back and forth. So anyways, the team, the install team decided, you know what, hell with it. We're going to fabricate it the way we know is best for us and to help us get the thing done. And then it came time, like we need to, like it's go time. We were supposed to be starting these chillers up in a few days. We need to get, we need to get the damn crane again. It's not in the budget. So what the guys did, it was awesome. They went to wherever and bought some balloons, helium balloons, and tied them around the pipe and took pictures of it and say, hey, we tried the cheapest route possible to get this pipe into the chiller yard and it's not working. I think we're going to need a crane. <laughs> it was it was awesome. But that picture got around and, you know, went further up the, the org chart. And the, our, the boss was like, get the damn crane. Well, we're going to have a crane for a day. What are we talking about? A couple thousand dollars? But the argument was there's it wasn't it, there wasn't a line item for the budget. Can't they just you know put hook up a grasshopper and and take it around the bend? And the, our leaders like no, like yes they could, but look at how much risk is there. They can get hurt. They can damage the existing space. Like that's not a good idea. Spend the two thousand dollars just because it wasn't a budgeted line item doesn't mean you can't spend that money. Like and so. Anyways, that was uh, that was the deal. It was it was amazing. I loved it. <laughs> yes, we took this as operational expense. The so always the argument. We're not arguing about inventory. Well, eh. let's not go there because right, right. there's <laughs> oftentimes there's pressure on a project to get inventory moved to the site so we can bill for that, so we can have cash flow. Yes, that's important. But if we if we if we're not careful bring in too much inventory we can't move there's this struggle and it's a yes. dance and i know how to dance yeah oh yeah <laughs> there is a support club for all the project managers who have worked with me in the past so <laughs> if you want if you're if you're interested they they, they talk and commiserate together because uh, <laughs> i know how to dance but uh, but uh, the reason why is because i learned their metrics yes learn their language right learn their language so mm -hmm. Cheat code for every super enterprising superintendent, general superintendent. Yes. Um, how to level up level up your argument game. Yep. Learn their language. Look look for their cash flow reports. Look for I mean they leave this stuff on their desks. Or, yeah. There. So yeah. Or they have it. They, they go to lunch and they leave their screen open. But it's there. But learn, it's available. Yeah, so learn learn the metrics and, and even better, uh, learn to share. So if we can share those important metrics, being like, hey. Like we need to make cash flow this month. I know, like we've we've curved this out, and like we need to. So like we need to get some inventory on the site so we can we can have we can we can pay our our trades on yep. time and not like put ourselves in a financial problem and we have to do other kinds of financial stuff. So, and that's a local optimum thing, right? So we like look at the job site over overall. I know I know it's really important to get the this operation and you're really into it thomas and there's an entire system entire project that we have to worry about so there's a give and take and we talked about that that smart compromise when we're talking about 5s and relationships there is this yep. is this is what happens in real life you have to make some compromises so it's it's incredibly important to share your metrics so if i'm the superintendent i'd be like i got this planned out here's the steps Here's the logistic plan. If we bring in this, if we bring in this air handler, so the we can pay train right, or or Marley or whoever, and pay the mechanical trade with that bill because it's 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 probably a big ticket item. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so we can have some cash flow. But we're not going to spend the owner's money not wisely. Right. We need, to, we need to have stay cash positive and be like, well, it doesn't work because we're doing this other thing. But you know what? Like, what if we set that thing there and we changed our schedule so we can put the dang thing on the roof where it needs to go. Yeah. That that would be like, you know what? And matter of fact, we need the thing up there anyways. At yep. we're just burning off work now. We yep. can do that later. And we can we can get that crane. Yeah. Both. Yeah. It's like, hey, mechanical trade, how much money did you have in your budget for hoisting? Yeah. Like, yes. Oh, and we had this this amount of, uh, okay awesome i'm gonna give you a change order i'm spending i'm now spending our owner's money very wisely because i'm yeah. not double paying for two cranes right 
one time. So, but if I wouldn't have known that as a project manager if I didn't talk to the field yep. operations staff and vice versa. There was no compromise. So we have to just share our metrics visibly and without redaction. This is hard because it's there's strategy, right? There's strategy. Yeah. There's <laughs> a whole other them. conversation about yeah. I'm not gonna go down that road. <laughs> drive poor behavior. Right. Like when when like it, it baffles me now. Back then it didn't. But now all of these players don't understand that they all have the same goal to build the stupid building. Yes. But they're combating against each other because, wait, I need to protect my budget. I need to protect my schedule. I need to pro like, no, no, no. We need to build the building. <laughs> yes. That's what we so, need to be doing. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, the goal is to build a building. But if we run out of cash, we can't pay our trades. Yep. Then the trades go away. Yep. Yep. We're like, oh, we're not making payroll this month. All right. See you later. So we have. So we have. There's a, there's a business end of the thing that we have to understand. Yeah. And we have to take that into consideration. And that's what I don't want to upset the experts again. But W. Edwards Deming, who I was wrong. He was he was working in the 50s and 60s as a mm -hmm. I think he was a consultant for the United States government. Mm -hmm. But he wrote. New economics in 1993. Okay. After the goal, by the way, 10 years. So, Dr. Deming maybe took a lesson or two by uh -huh. Dr. Goldratt, maybe. But Dr. Deming, he derided traditional Western management techniques and said, and what he said was, what we need is cooperation and a transformation of a new style of management. This is that. Yep. This is that, hey, you got metrics, you got a schedule, you got a strategy financially, you got a strategy for operations we gotta we gotta talk about we gotta use our words yes put stuff on like draw pictures on walls like s curves of cash flow mm -hmm. and perhaps a gantt chart or perhaps a sticky note or two yep. on the wall so how can you control flow on your job site through the management of inventory we just talked about it. yeah well um, yeah story and i did it this was a poor that could help me understand we we're doing a renovation of a, a brewery here in san antonio and i it was the first project well ah, you know what that was the very first project that out of the gate myself my project manager we decided okay we're gonna do last planner system full last planner system to the best of our understanding and and i know that that means something different to everybody that's doing last planner system out there and we're gonna do 5s and i'm gonna do just in time delivery like we're going to do all of these things on this project. And, and so I challenged my team. I said, guys, we are going to do this project with zero connexes, zero storage containers on site. And of course, they, they looked at me cross-eyed because we're used to having six, eight damn storage containers, but they were all just dumpsters, right? Like dark and hot dumpsters. So we compromised and said, okay, we're going to have one connex. And what I did to like this, this, inventory management we broke down all the work that we were doing we had isometrics for every single da, 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 all this stuff and i released material based on that and i knew what we we're going to be working on the next week so i would receive the material the the week the friday proceeding and it was just for the work that we planned to do next week and it was there was no bundles and bundles of copper it was all tag bagged and tagged specifically for an area and this helped, right? We didn't have a lot of clutter, minimized our time on the on the the buck hoist. Like it was clicking until we started like, I don't know what it was. It could have been, I miscounted how much pipe a particular package needed or it got left laying around. Somebody snagged it and took it to sell it. Like who knows? But we started running out of copper. I didn't have any inventory. So they were working and if they didn't install it exactly as I drew it per the ISO. So for example, if I drew in there a nine inch and a half nineties and they had to route it differently or didn't follow the isometric drawing, I didn't have an right. extra. Yeah. I didn't have an extra inch and a half 90. So what they it's would like do me is going to home Depot every time I tried it. You got it. And so they would go to the package yeah. that we're supposed to be installing Wednesday or Thursday and pull scab out of that. And so at the end of the week, the weeks, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're smoking. Thursday, Friday, we're sucking. Like, what is going on here? Why are we yeah. short material? So my takeaway from like, it, it helped minimize like deliveries. It was super awesome, except for that. We, I had to get 
a small amount of inventory to be able to absorb those kinds of decisions that they actually had to make so that it wouldn't stop production. And, and it was the guys, and again, we are trying, it was like, we're going to do everything that we ever read on this project. <laughs> and son of a gun, man, was it painful. And my team was like, Jesse, you're making our lives miserable. So I'm sorry, we're, we're learning, guys. We're like, shut yeah. up, I don't want to learn anymore. Yeah. yeah, no, but it's real. Yes. Actually, that's, that's um, so I, I was reading my notes because I had the same kind of realization. Uh, what I was figuring when I was doing my flow line or my line of balance studies, one of my notes is put put the cost of downtime on the balance sheet. Ooh. What's the cost of downtime? That was that's my note. Yeah. And again, this is like early in my journey. I don't think I understand. But my next note on the next page, I said the cost of getting better should net less than zero. Because Ooh. if you do any improvement, it shouldn't you shouldn't cost it shouldn't be more. Right. Right. Like if, if 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 you're if you're if you're doing process improvement and your and your downtime or whatever your metrics your financial metrics are increasing yep. your profit but whatever all those if they're not if they're not increasing and your your cost that operational expense of paying people to stand around so, yeah so what I did and I'll go back to my little walk up the hill study yes yes because I was like we have to maximize the crane, the hoist, and the loading dock, because all of these are fixed. These are all fixed. They can only be used in a like, the, the, especially the the loading dock, because we had we had rules about because we're on Howard Street in San Francisco. We can close all the lanes, so we're limited on the time we use that that area. So I figured that out. I wrote it out and I time blocked deliveries. Yep. And what I did, I came to the realization was when I did that flow line study, I also tried to figure out when they did the delivery, like the raising yeah. gang, and, the, and I created this little chart in Excel. And I said the delivery, and then what like what the, the expected production was that. So if it was steel delivery, it was number of pieces. If it was decking, it was square feet. If yep. it was stairs, it would be number of, number of floors. If it was mechanical pipes, it would be number of floors. If it yep. was boom, it's just boom, 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 boom. I went down and I created this little list and I was like, and I went from raising gang, so setting steel yep. frame all the way through concrete placed. And then on the side of that, I like it. So I did the chart. And then on the next thing I did was said every time it was some, something was planned to be delivered based Ooh. upon this rate, there was a real date because I knew the dates on our schedule when things needed to be done. So I said, well, this needs to be delivered no no later than this date for us to make that. So I did a yeah. very, very simple calculation. And this is probably some tech trains happening in my brain. Yeah. I was like, I need to know how much time it takes to drive a truck in, pick, the, pick it up from the grain, drive it over, lower it down. And so I started to look at the cycle time in the crane. So yeah. how long it would take to move one. And I'm like... So we, I would talk to the crane operator and be like, how many moves? Because he's, he's doing the stuff, like yeah. he's making the moves. And we're like, hey, Brian, about how long are you doing a action and about how long are you just sitting not there. moving? Mm -hmm. And he, he was honest. He'd tell me. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. What we did, and this was like experimental. We are like, what if I gave you the loading plan, so like the the crane operator was separate from the rest of the trades. Like they, I think the crane worked for the steel director, but then right. we bought time with the other trades. He was like, you can do that. And I was like, yeah, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so I gave him the spreadsheet. I'm like, these are the dates. The first week it was like, he was like, this thing sucks. Like all, nothing worked. Of course. All of, all of your proposed delivery times, no one followed the rules. I was like, good. And it was really good feedback. Like he wasn't, he wasn't a pain about it. So I was like, okay, we need to have something that's more agile than Excel spreadsheet. And I print it out and I give it to him at five in the morning while he's climbing up the hoist or climbing up the crane. Yeah. And at that time, Google Calendar ah. was kind of a thing. It was very yeah. early for me. And I'm like, I'm going to create a Google Calendar and we're going to time block the, the loading dock. Everybody at 20 minutes, half hour, whatever it was. And everybody got a color. 
But then if we made like minor changes, like, oh, this truck is stuck on a bridge, this truck, like slide this up, slide this guy around. Usually what normally traditional construction, we'd talk on the radio. We'd be like, yep. hey, crane operator, blah, 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 blah. And then they, that way they know. But I was like, no, we're going to shoot it into his eyeballs from a cell phone. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so what we do, I, we like, I made that note. I'm like, we need to optimize that was the bottleneck was the hoist it wasn't the crane the crane sat idle the hoist it was was moving up and down and it, yep. and it, and it worked yeah <laughs> but yeah but the loading dock was the bottleneck so i'm like we have to optimize there this is the spot because what i was seeing was we weren't following the rules we were yep. not disciplined about the loading dock we were just like use it or lose it I was like, nope, no longer. This is no longer use it or lose it. You, you schedule and we're we're going to be very militant about. And yes. what we did, guess what we did? We said the crane operator. He's got the hook, right? Yeah. So if it wasn't your time, you don't get the hook. Woo! <laughs> Woo -hoo! Yes. And yes. Brian is a great guy. He probably still probably sitting on a crane right now. But yeah. uh, he was he was like, no, this is you're not on the schedule. Like go away and yes. Yeah, so yes. So that way we wouldn't back up or have major lulls. So people yep. started to once we were very clear that hey, when it's your time, you get the crane. No, no factor. But when right. it's not your time, it's not you your time. It. You go That's drive it. around the city. <laughs> Come yep. back when it's your time. And people align to that very quickly. Very yep. quickly. Yep. Um, so then we got less downtime on the crane. We had this much flow. Like it, it are increased this much with flow. So we did that for like a month and I was like, Hey, I just read this book about metrics and financials. Like, how are we doing? And our, I guess it would be operational expense and inventory. Like, yeah. how are we doing against that? Like, cause we're billing for inventory. I guess we're billing for throughput because stuff is getting up into an install and we're like, our cash flow is ahead right now. I was like, mm -hmm. interesting. Interesting. Like I was like, I was probably like, I went home and I was all bragging about it. But, oh yeah. Hey. But I was like, that is it was really interesting. So it was a minor experiment, but we found it found its way to our financial. Yeah. Because we did, we were we started to get ahead of our original planned billing cycle. Yeah. Because of of a little bit of op, op, optimization. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the new economics. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 that's. Session one, by the way, Woo! <laughs> if you want to keep going, I can keep going, but I wanted to say, let's say this, because I wanted to go back to the theory of constraints and there's five steps and we kind of talked about all of them. Number one, identify your systems. Constraint. You have to confront fear. You have a constraint. It's something you're uncomfortable about. Focus, do action, focus, do action, focus, do action. If it's very, 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 very threatening, get professional help. Right. Talk to your vice president of operations yep. or, or yes. principals of the trade companies or the crane operator or yep. uh, hoist operators or your safety personnel like or project manager, project executive, like elevate. I guess that's the next step coming up here to decide how to exploit constraints. Right. Once you say like Thomas figured out the loading dock is the issue in this particular phase of the project. Yep. All the downtime associated with the, the, the tower crane was wasn't being utilized enough because it was either we had a traffic jam of trucks or we had yep. major windows of nothing. So we can we can optimize that. So you have to decide how to exploit it. And the ex exploited example was Brian left the hook 400 feet in the air. Said, "Nah, not your time." I mean, you have yep. to make that decision. Three, ex subordinate everything else to that decision. Right. Yeah. It's not like uh, when the yes. plumbing foreman was like, Thomas, all of your pipe for level 22 right here. It's right here, man. It's coming, you can baby. Load it right now. Well, it you can time. load it now. I'm like, no, it's rebar. This is rebar for 30. Yes. I guess it wasn't that tall of a building. Yep. <laughs> it's rebar for 28. That's, and, and they're right behind you. So you have to drive around the, the block and get behind the rebar. That's the deal. That yep. That is because it's for our flow to, for yep. us to get into line, we have to subordinate. That means when you feel conflict and you feel anxiety, you feel pressure, you have to go back to your first decision. We're optimizing this, this, this yep. tower, crane, right? Yep. So you have to be steadfast. That means steadfast. Like you have to not waver like yes. your hand. 
Yeah. So that's like, that's power. Like being yes. steadfast is being super calm in the face of adversity. That's power. Not yes. being violent or like going yep. around the corner and beating somebody up. That's not power. <laughs> no, right? right, right. Right. And then if you if you get stuck on step three and you can't subordinate your decisions, elevate it. Go yeah. a level up. Go two levels up. And you have to take, you can't hand the problem to your, to the person above you. <laughs> right. saying like, hey, but you, when you come into that situation, figure out the issues, f do some study, being like, this is the thing, this is the thing we need you to, we need a referee to make a decision so we can move forward. And once, once you get to that point and you make that decision, it's leadership. Yes. That is the leadership step. So if you, if, if. If you're a leader listening to this and somebody comes to you and they're stuck and they have, they've done the study, they have, they've figured out the root cause, they've, they've, they've talked to people, you don't make a decision, you put it back on them, that's bullshit. That's BS. Yes. yes. You're a poor leader. Yes. So, yes. Like, no BS with Jen and Jess, that's the BS that we talked about. Straight so up. If you're confronted with a decision and you, and not, I'm not saying you make a bad decision or a good decision. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, if you put it back on the person being like, no, go figure it out or, nah, or like, eh, or don't take action. Worse. Yep. Oh, that's BS. Cause that way you've just, you've just elevated the constraint. Yep. <laughs> you've not fixed it. You've not relieved it. You've just made it worse because now it's sitting in corporate land. That's how we lose trust in each other. And that, yes. so if we can make that decision, if, if you get it, if you get a constraint that's elevated to you, take it very seriously. And so the trick is the fifth step that Dr. Goldratt teaches us. And he says, this is, this is inertia and this is the new economics thing. He says, if all of those steps didn't work, you didn't remove the constraint. You've elevated it to principles of companies. You've, you've done all kinds of studies and you've, you're stuck because of policy or a business deal or just, just some kind of red tertiary tape. thing. Yep. Yeah. It'll get stuck there. So if, if that happens, you can't change laws. We can't get Congress to act fast, right? It's so hard to get through red tape. If that happens, go back to step one, yep. right? Go all the way back to step one and see like you're at the, you, you didn't find the constraint. You didn't go back to cause and effect, cause and effect. You found a, you found a root, a problem that it was a business deal that we made or it was a, you know, it's like a policy or it's a safety concern. Like, hey, we need to get this crazy zoom boom contraption. That's really expensive to do this, safely do this work. That's not the constraint. The constraint is we didn't design the work to Thank be easily you. installed. Yes. That was the constraint. So it's not, it's not the budget that was the constraint. It's our planning process. And right? yes. so we have to go back to step one and start over. It's hard and it's, it's, but Dr. Goldratt says, do not allow inertia to cause a system of constraint. What's yes. inertia to you? Movement or lack of, right? Like if I'm moving in a direction, there's just a natural, there's going to take energy for me to slow down or divert my path. And so that's, that's the, that's when I feel the inertia. And so if I'm moving in a path of, eh, that's just the way it is, like that's, I got to combat that. That's the inertia. It's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's the inertia. So when you're confronted with that and you get to that, it's really hard to make changes. Like people yeah. dig their heels in when you get to inertia. So don't get resentful. Don't get frustrated. Go back to step one and look yep. for new constraints. That's, that's the advice. And that's what they do in the book. They go back and uh, that's the next chapter. Keep going. One or two more. Well, before we go, I'm going to say, like, I don't know if you, you may not be able to, because I'm listening to you and I've worked with you and I see the way you care, you present and the way you show up. Like, these are all system processy things. But for the listener, like, if you're not picking up on Thomas's humility and openness, like the fact that he went and studied, watched from the hill, and then went and talked to the crane operator. And when it taught, like knowing all of these processes and these laws is, is it's a, only the tip of the iceberg, because if you can't connect with the human beings. <laughs> yes. Talking to Carlos, the decking foreman. 
Yes. You're like, hey, we need all of your your openings. We have to detail all of them because it's a mold. They're building a mold for concrete, right? So yeah. they need to close the mold. And yeah. there's funky curtain wall dimensions. I call them critical dimensions. It's all that you need. If you don't have the, what I mean by critical dimensions, if you didn't have the dimension, could not, you're either going to do it wrong or you can't move forward. Yep. <laughs> so in, in decking, they do all the detailing around yes. open. So the, the mild steel, the, the rusty iron looking stuff, that gets set around elevators and stairs, but around mechanical openings and other smaller openings, oftentimes that's done with gauge metal or sheet metal. Yep. And that has to be, and that dimensions also have to be done. And so we have to give those dimensions. And at that time, the, the big openings were fixed. Like we knew that as you can set that up, but this was an office building still being designed and developed. So yep. changes were constantly happening. So Carlos and his gang got spread out. And so they were having to go back, go back mm -hmm. down. And we were working them on crazy hours, crazy yep. hours. And uh, they were getting burned out. So then it was like, how oh, are you guys so slow? You're tired, you're complaining. And, uh, but when I went and I talked to him, he was like, hey, when we, because they have lots of gear, right? they have yep. Nelson studs. Oh, have, yeah. It's heavy, right? And they have welding leads. Yeah, that's. And they have welding machines. They have lots of stuff. And when they're done on a floor, they got to get all that stuff off and move it up. Well, guess who's in control of the hoist? Mm -hmm. Right? Boom. Mm -hmm. Me. So yes. we had that conversation. I was like, yeah. You have a human being connection. That's it. Caring and about, and it wasn't about, hey, we're behind schedule, blah, blah. We were ahead of schedule at that point. It wasn't about, it wasn't about being behind at that point. It was about now all of a sudden we were, we weren't panicked about time. Yep. Because we were doing optimal things. We were starting to optimize things and get things in the flow. So at that time, and I thank you for bringing this up. Because then it was like, we no longer have to look at things. We can look at people, human beings. Yes. And Let's Carlos was like, seven days a week. hey, a, long, a big part of their, when they go from floor to floor, they have to take all their gear. And if they have to go back down, they have to take their gear from boom, boom. Yep. Well, that's, that, that's not right. <laughs> like, no, that we, ain't cool. How can we do better? Like, how can we do better? So saying, hey, when we move our stuff, we need some help. We're like, hey, I have some, we have labor, right? We have, yep. we have, we can optimize a hoist and just monopolize it for yep. the decking team and just yes. do that. When they, when they need to make their move, we can make it very, very efficient for them. So they're not sitting there waiting for hoists and stuff like that. And that happened with human connections, conversations yes. and observing their work in a, in a objective manner. Meaning yes. like, I don't, I'm not going down to that floor and thinking that they're slow. I'm going down to that floor and thinking, how can I help them? Yes. 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 That's, that's, so that's what, what I, but that's, that's what it. optimizing does. Yes. That's what optimizing does. All of a sudden we're not arguing over lines on a piece of paper. We're arguing about, Hey, we need a, we need a, I need to get a, a hoist at 1230 and park it on nine so we yep. can load our gear. And then take it up to 12. Yes. It's like, boom, put that on the Google calendar. We got, so all of a sudden we didn't even only had it for the, the train. We had a Google calendar for hoist, both cars. There's yeah. two. Yeah. One color, one color. We had nice. it for the parking, parking or the, you know, the, the loading dock. Yeah. Where like we started to use colors to designate it. Cause you like, it takes too long to read. Yes. What's on yeah. the little time block. So use a color being like, oh, hoist. And it was like the hoist was painted red. So we made the hoist blocks red. The yep. crane painted yellow, made the crane. Yep. <laughs> so it, it made it really easy. But uh, yeah, like we all, the only way we did op optimizing was through study of the work. So we'd go yep. observe, we would make, make human connections, being like, hey, what's this? This seems, this seems to take a long time, or this seems to take you extra time. And yes. we, we're seeing that in our metrics, like our flow lines are colliding or we're getting behind in cash flow or those kind of things. Like we can, we can start to see that. And once we do that, there is no blame. Right. Right. There's no blame. Right. No, because we can all redesign the work. We can redesign the work. The people, period. Yes. Yeah, so step four. Yep. 
yep. after gold, right? Yep. Go back. Or I guess step five. If if you can't, if you're completely stuck and you're you've run against science or law, go back and find a new optimization. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I think we wrap <laughs> on that, Thomas. Okay. Yeah. I think we actually did. Oh, here I'll do the good. visual. <laughs> In terms of time, we covered four chapters. You can get a screenshot on my flow line. Oh, let's check it out. It's so simple. Maybe I'll take a screenshot and I'll do a brief discussion and see if it works. This is my early sketch. So I didn't even know what I was doing. You can get it? No. Come on. Oh, no. Hang on, I'll turn off my. Oh, there we go. Oh, damn, it went away. I can see your fingertips. That's it. Give me a second. I'll turn off my background. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Oh, there we go. I see it. Got it? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Pull plan. <laughs> yes. So you yes. see the inputs. So I was trying to be like, what you're seeing there, as I was trying to think about, and I have very poor handwriting, but I was on, on one sheet, I was writing, what are the inputs to, to planning? Ah. Schedule. This is our CPM schedule. So I said, I, it's the business deal, right? Say what you want about CPM. They are linked to our contracts with business deals. We have to do yep. every. Do we have to be addicted to them and make them 5,000 lines? No, but we have to do that for <laughs> business deals required by contract. Right? Yep. This is how the world works. Yes. Two, the master schedule sets up your strategy. So if you have a, if you, if you do it very well, you can set up all your location, all your locations, all your location data is set up in your work breakdown structure in your, in your, in your P6 schedule. So you build in your location base. So that sets up your Y axis. So now I have both. I now have my X axis in time and I have Y axis in locations. So now I can, I can train a computer program or you can do even do an Excel. Right. You can do it by hand back like, yep. Shout out to Empire State Building. They would chart it out by hand. But if you understand location and you understand time and you understand when things are completed, you can chart that out. Yep. Then last planner system comes into play. So I, I wrote that one input was your yep. pull plan because there's not enough information in, especially that project. We didn't yep. have tons of items in our master scale, but, but we had, it gave us the structure, gave us our milestones to do pull planning. So the input to adjust our location data because there wasn't enough information in our six schedule to get more data points, uh, yep. finish plan starts and actual finishes. We had we had to get the the look ahead plan input, and then we also had our what the cartoon input was our visual management system. So that was our zones. So we plan. The work in vertical in chunks based yeah. on based on your production rate. So like a steel erectors that their columns were two stories high. So their their zones. So everybody was in that that phase of work in superstructure. You worked in two floor zones. And then yeah. if you were in mechanical or plumbing or HVAC or most of the other trades, you don't work in two floors. You work one because you have your installing right. stuff to deck. You're yep. installing stuff to walls. You're working on one floor at a time. Yep. So the your zones you. change. Yeah. So another input for that was was our cartoons. We call them cartoons. But other people would call them I don't know, tack trains. Yep. Color ups. And then the the one on the right, I can barely read it, but it was it was our productivities. So it was our planned productivities, and we got that from our BIM model. So if we knew our if we knew location and we knew and we knew the time we needed to know the number of units yes number of and luckily we had a, this project this is why it was like kind of like the golden era we had yeah. a really good vdc manager nathan he would pull all this metric not metrics he would pull all the quantities the, yeah. yeah quantities out be like this floor has 320 of concrete this floor has this many tons of steel and i was like yes. we can back into rates Yes. yes. <laughs> right. So the only question we asked that pull plans was number of number of head heads, number of people. Yeah. So that so I was like, then we can we can we can back into productivity rates, and we were damn close. Yeah. Looking and and I did once the project was over. We we did a couple LCI 
Congress studies, this is all published. We went back and we crunched the data and we looked at variation between plan and actual, and that's kind of another story. Maybe you go back and look at the, go, yeah. go back into the archives at LCI. But, but the other input, the input coming in from the bottom, I don't know if you saw it, it says trade partners provide product predictions, right? So we did the poll plan. But we actually, we, what we did was we figured out our rates and we had our pitch lines and it wasn't like super, this was not, this was Thomas. Like I'm from Nebraska. Like I don't, I'm, I'm simple. So we just had simple conversation, but we're like, Hey, can you predict based upon this information that I'm giving? And we know about your rate of, of yep. production. We, we know your throughput. We, we figured out throughput close. Can you predict where your next move is going to be? And that, that yeah until we did that until we made that human connection because they know they know all the stuff they know how long it takes to roll up the leads this, right this. like this is if we don't if we don't include our human beings into the production systems they won't be accurate they Correct. won't be accurate they because no. you're not including because there's a human element and that's what we learned in the goal was Yes, you have a robot. It's super productive and it just cranks out stuff, but it's only local off. Yes. So, the out, so those were all inputs and the output from doing all of that study was a six week look ahead. Yeah. We did this in Excel. Like this was nothing fancy. Yeah. And it was like, well, why don't you put it into this robust? I'm like, I don't have to, it's not going to move. We're good. <laughs> right. We're like, good. Once we have optimized and we've done this, and now I now I know like like Jason Schroeder does this in Excel. Now you know why you don't need any logic once you've done all of that study and you put all your tax trains and it looks like a waterfall. The reason why that works is because it's super reliable. Yeah. Super reliable. And it's not gonna move. And even if it does, it moves like a little bit. And yep. you use your buffer. Let let put a buffer let, on the end of the, the drain. Buffer, eat it. Yep. Yep. yep and that's yep. and uh, and we did the LCI Congress event, and you can see our our PPC just went skyrocketed. Yep. It went into, and I'm not good at the number because the number doesn't matter. It right. doesn't matter what the number is. I'm saying it was the same week after week after week after week after week, and and we had some issues beyond our control. Whether there was some union rumblings at the time, and you can see. And, and I charted it, the dates when those things happen as well. Mm -hmm. That's when we had the variation. Yep. Yes. So uh, the number, whatever our PPC didn't matter. I'm not going to brag about it because it doesn't matter. The The metric was that it was flat. Yes. It was so Consistent reliable. Consistent and, and got, reliable. When we got, uh, and the, the first, what are we in chapter 11? Yep. <laughs> I learned all of that in 10 chapters, or at least learn how to like go look for stuff in the front half of this book. And that's why I'm so compelled to talk about it. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying it did happen on one project and happened again and again. And again. Yeah. And that's, every project is not the same because we didn't have all the optimizations. Right. Because of other constraints. But I will say we found success and we, we were made incredibly reliable through those inputs. And I'll just read them again. So your, your visualiz visualization, you do poll planning, like last planner steps. You get quantities out of your BIM model. Get the actual quantities, actual quantities, linear feet of pipe. Yep. Tons of rebar, cubic yards of concrete. Get those, get those yep. quantities. And then once you do that, go talk to your trades. Yep. Have individual conversation with trades. Later, Iris Tomlin has this whole prescribed method that she would teach me to do this. This would be years later. Yeah. But, but so then once you do all that, do your optimization. Only then do you print a look ahead, yep. look ahead plan. And yes. after that, I mean, I think at last planner, they call that making work ready. Make ready planning. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right? Cause then you don't have to worry about making new schedules every freaking week for hours and hours. Now all the, all of a sudden you have time to go look for other stuff. And uh, right? like, like all like, of a sudden you can go to like your base. Carlos. Hey, yes. We'll help you roll up your welding leads or, Hey, let's go to the baseball game. <laughs> yeah. Like go yeah. home. Yeah. Let's go home. Let's go home before 9 PM. Let's go to my, my cousin's baseball game. Now you can really do some really yeah. meaningful stuff. Like, yeah, no. and we had, yeah, we would, we would have conversations yep. about not work stuff. Yep. And, and so 
the so my thing was um, what is the reliability the feeling it's a vibe mm. it is a vibe it's an energy yes you can see it in 10 seconds yes yes you, no, you don't even see it you feel it yeah um, you feel it in the air so if, if there is if you have flow and not like perfect nope. no no <laughs> because you won't have, have it but if you have flow people are generally interested in fixing stuff yeah right? or being like hey let's go study this issue or let's go talk to this third party like they're generally people generally get in interested remember that last that self assessment i did to myself right yeah like hey let's let's be optimistic of things and try it and see what happens right or on the flip side of the coin what's the what's the indicator for 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 poor poor metrics or poor leadership or bad flow it's another vibe oh hell yeah yeah it's I've been the most there too. common vibe that's yeah. the bad part <laughs> it's the most common vibe out there and what usually works in that environment is the loudest person or the bully yes. or leveraged deals right we yes. make leveraged deals and what i mean by leveraged deals is like we will we will pick favorites yes and then everybody else is second second fit and then start playing right. pitting them against each other like oh yeah, yeah. like that's and most of my career thomas <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, i've worked all over the united states and it's exactly the same i haven't worked Ever. yeah it's it's not that we mean to do it that's just how the system works right because we're all pitted against each other because it's super complicated there's all kinds of moving parts and if we're not optimizing we'll have problems and if we don't face those problems because we're afraid of them and not because like we're scared, like we're weak. It's that we are uncomfortable because we have anxiety around confronting our issues. If we don't confront those problems, they will they get bigger. They get yeah. bigger and bigger. Yeah, man. Awesome. So take away, folks, if you're <laughs> listening, humility, be cool, talk to people. And then at this last end, you, you're talking about how you, you collected the quantities, you collected the different inputs to create this beautiful plan. And then you talk to the trades again, right? Yes. And so I, I got to go there. I got to hammer that because all of those other things, I think people are very skilled at. They know how to like, okay, let me pull quantities. Let me go count. Let me go measure. Let me do all those things. And then they produce a plan. They never talk to people. It's hard. That's the hardest step in last planner is that make yes. ready planning session. Yes. Because you need, and it, it's hard because you have to gather all those people together. Yes. You need you need iron worker, you need concrete, you need, you, and yep. like you have to get everybody in focus together at the same time and care about each other. Yep. But what I what I, I'll say on that particular project, the the stars kind of aligned and we got along, and then then all of a sudden it's like it lowered the barrier of entry. So when yep. we did our trade partner meeting, our coordination, our make ready session, people gave us really good input. Like it yeah. was really helpful. And when we got that input, cheat code, the reason why it's hard is if we did all this work and we, we VDC was involved and we talked to like, we were the, we talked to the accountants, right? And it's like, we did all this work. And then the trade was like, nah, like I can't, I can't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't physically work. And Jeff Landry called me out in a meeting. Jeff yeah. Landry, Herrick, Herrick Steele. Called me out. He's like, this, this is, this is wrong, Thomas. This is, this doesn't work. And I was like, damn, okay. Go check. But you yep. know what? Well, you know what we did? We changed it. Exactly. <laughs> Ex that's the, yes. Did all you those steps. And then at that last point, if you don't change, right? You, step, you, step five yep. of a theory of constraints. If you don't change and inertia happens, go back to step one. Yes. And so that's why why make ready planning is so incredibly hard because it takes all that effort yeah. and at that last moment that last planning moment yes. i guess the last plan would happen at the at the huddle but uh, at at a particular moment if you don't make that modification to your plan all of that is for wasted it doesn't it, matter it won't happen anyways exactly. if you want an incredibly reliable plan you have to do all that step do all that study because you need all that information to make a determination and you have to give it to the trade so they can make a decision yes in a, in a very simple and easy to digest manner yes. you can't just throw worksheets at people so we have to use cartoons yes and spreadsheets and graphs and charts and colors and patterns and all the all the all the focusing steps yep <laughs> evaporating clouds yep 
once we do that and we make the change so in the book they're like we need we got to figure something out about this robot this is not this isn't this isn't the this is the bottleneck this is the constraint yep so in in the next few chapters they take steps to the to work around the robot which was a big no-no at corporate at the hq right <laughs> right yeah, so yeah that's the that's the fear that's why i wanted to start with fear it was like when you're confronted with fear you can take action yeah and you can also focus like these are yeah. two things you can do if you lock up or we revert back to our traditional methods we won't get any better oh i love that yeah i love that I had a potential client ask me well like do i have a guarantee around you know the the improvement that's going to happen i say yes so you this is my guarantee i guarantee if you can if you choose to leave things as they are you are guaranteed to continue getting the results that you're getting that's my guarantee <laughs> boom all right well we'll wrap it up next time we're starting on chapter 12. 12. chapter 12 baby it's coming oh man what did i tell you like it's just the storytelling of what happened on the job. He never really said it directly, but like his true care and compassion for the human beings and the discovery he had around connecting with the people out on the job. Yes, all the processes. Yes, all the magical formulas. But when it really came to life was right after he started really spending vulnerable, intimate, courageous time with the folks out there on the job and like y'all know me that's the way i roll it's all about the people people before processes all the time every time that's how you make the processes work so man i can't wait for the next one and we're going to give a shout out to our lnm family member i didn't get permission for this one so i might get in trouble but y'all know i'm okay with that this one comes from miss christine fuentes she sent me a text and, and it just lights me up her text says, started reading Lean in Love, uh, you and Jen, y'all short-term goal on page nine. And I had to let you know that I feel you have accomplished it. So, and the goal is to help enhance the quality of life for at least one person. She says, that one person is her in a sea of many. Like I have tears already, right? Like when I read it, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. She also goes on to say, I also am a working professional and care for folks in and outside of work. I'm not giving myself enough credit, but will continue to work on those ripples of impact. Thank you, Christine, because yes, that is the goal to help one person and you and I've worked together. And so being able to contribute into your life and, and you giving that feedback and letting me know, um, letting me and Jen know that we have helped you in some way is like the ultimate. I appreciate that. The only ask I have is that you pay that forward because you got plenty to offer to the world. And so does the rest of the l &M family. Keep on making them ripples of impact. Let people know you care about them. Let them know what you appreciate about them. And then the rest will take care of itself. Thanks again. Be cool. And we'll talk at you next time. Peace. Oh my goodness, you're either driving down the road or just so enthralled with the, with this whole podcast that you went all the way down to the very, 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 very end of it. And we appreciate you. And just, we're going to take this as an indication of your dedication. So we got a little special request of you, a call to action, because everybody tells us that like, you need to have a call to action. So here's the call to action. Be kind to yourself. Go out there and share a smile with someone.